Praise the Lord and uh, Shalom, everyone. Thank you, Paul, Lyndon, uh, Subhashis, and Zalatoli for uh, uh, joining class this morning. We'll uh, begin. Uh, can I ask uh, Lyndon to lead us in prayer, please? Lyndon, can you lead us in prayer, please? Okay, Subhashis, thank you. Yes. Let's pray. Loving Father, once again, Lord, we thank you so much for this beautiful morning. Lord, thank you for adding one more day in our life lord thank you for bringing us together lord to know your word and to lord work in your truth lord i ask your presence in midst of us lord and i ask uh, lord you uh, lead uh, pastor lord as uh, she will be teaching us lord holy spirit i pray that you bless her lord anoint with your power and uh let bless us that lord will have a good network connection and i pray for all the dear ones lord those who will be attending and uh, bless them in jesus name i pray amen amen thank you subhashish uh, so last friday we began studying uh, titus chapter 3 and in titus chapter 3 uh, paul uh, um, admonishes or encourages tells Tim, uh, titus uh, that the church or the believers in the churches um, at crete have to be obedient to the governing authorities and uh, that is in verses 1 and 2 and then in verses uh, 3 following right up to verse 8 paul lists uh, seven characteristics of unbelievers and then paul goes on to mention in verses 4 and and below uh, the basis um, of our salvation uh, so he says what is the basis of our salvation is god's kindness his love and mercy and then uh, he goes on to talk about the effects of our salvation, which is regeneration and renewal. And verse 7, he also talks about another effect of our salvation, uh, which is justification. And then he presents the means for our salvation. And he says the means for our salvation is to the power of the Holy Spirit uh, that is at work uh, through Jesus Christ. So the power of the Holy Spirit through the work of Jesus Christ. So we'll move on to verses 9 um, following of chapter 3 of Titus. So can somebody please read verses uh, 9 to 11 that Paul uh, is writing about uh, rejecting uh, false controversies. So can one of you please read Titus chapter 3, verses 9 to 11, please? But avoid foolish disputes, genealogies, contentions, and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and useless. Reject a Reject a divisive man after the first and second admonition, knowing that such a person is worth and sinning, being self-condemned. Amen. Thank you, Spashis. So in verse 9, uh, Paul begins by writing, says, but avoid. So the but introduces the readers to the con contrast between what is important, that is, what is the priority, and what must be avoided, uh, not only because it is useless, but because also uh, it is very dangerous to one's spiritual life or to one's faith in Christ Jesus. And then he says, avoid. So here he's basically saying that, you know, he's commanding or he's presenting a command, uh, uh, you know, for continual attitude that seeks to avoid useless discussion so like um, he wrote to timothy as well in first and second timothy here again he's writing to titus and to the believers at crete and he's telling them you know avoid uh, uh, uh try to avoid do your best to avoid you know useless discussions and he mentions foolish disputes genealogies contentions and strivings about uh, the law now, um, these four basically describe uh, together uh, 
uh, you know, the nature of what Titus or the Cretans and all believers may face. So, you know, the Titans, uh, the sorry, the the uh, the Cretans, uh, Titus, um, and you know, uh, believers even today will face, um, you know, uh, false teachers who go about, you know, with their false disputes, uh, contentions, strivings about. Uh, the word of God, and in Paul's time, it was about the law and also about the Old Testament um, uh, genealogies. So, what are these foolish disputes? Paul describes uh, uh, controversies as foolish uh, because, uh, you know, um, uh, no matter how brilliant. Uh, the presentation is or how scholarly these false teachers may appear you know uh, uh, the stress seems to be on an exchange of words rather than uh, just genuine search of truth so if somebody is genuinely searching for truth then yes we can um, you know uh, uh, discuss with them we can present the truth of the gospel but if somebody is just looking for exchange of words rather than searching for the truth then you know uh, it's it's important that uh, we avoid such foolish disputes and uh, arguments uh, because they're anyway not interested in the truth they're anyway not going to heed the gospel the truth in the scripture so there's no point talking to them because they're just interested in words so paul is saying you know don't uh, spend time in these useless unprofitable uh, uh, discussions uh, with the faith uh, and which is not, you know, useful and productive for one's faith or for one's Christian uh, living. Now, these the words genealogies and disputes about the law <coughs> point to us more precisely the nature and the source of these foolish arguments and empty discussions. So it's basically, you know, uh, these this foolish discussions ab about these genealogies and disputes about the law, uh, which is uh, kind of uh, fictitious additions uh, that were added by a few Jews uh, to the existing genealogies in the uh, Old Testament or to the Old Testament uh, saints. So he's saying, hey, this is really uh, no, uh, not profitable. This is useless. So just avoid it totally. Okay, And then he says it's unprofitable and useless, which he refers back to uh, verse 8 in the same chapter uh, 3, where Paul instructed uh, Titus to speak confidently about the truth of the gospel. So Paul's uh, standard is whether, you know, um, a matter is worth de debating uh, is does it relate to the gospel? Is the conversation genuine? Is the person looking out for the truth? Or they are going to heed the truth that you're going to present from a scripture? Is it going to lead that person to faith in Christ Jesus? It's going to lead them to godliness or is it going to lead them to, you know, godly living and to good deeds? If it's not, then t Paul is telling Titus, don't waste your time on this, okay? Verses 10 and 11, he says, reject a divisive man. So reject means basically uh, avoid them, shun them, you know, just uh, decline them, don't have anything to do with uh, uh, discussing with them. Uh, and does not mean, you know, excommunicating them, but, you know, just avoid them, you know. Uh, decline them when they come to you for uh, discussions. Um, and he says, have nothing to do with uh, them. Have nothing to do with them means have nothing to do with either warning them, rebuking them, or even having a dialogue or discussion with them. So totally avoid them. Now don't have any dialogue, discussion, don't even warn them and rebuke them. Okay. And then he says a divisive man. A divisive man means a man who causes divisions by his teaching. And uh, he says, you know, uh, reject a divisive man after the first and second admonition. That means, you know, uh, uh, correct him, uh, you know, warn him once, twice. And if he continues to 
disobey, if he continues to hold on to the false teachings and his disputes and these endless genealogies, then he says, have nothing to do with um, them. You know, just simply leave them to their uh, self, to their own plans. And he says, such a man is warped. Uh, warped means twisted. You know, these false teachers uh, turn away from the truth inside out. So they have a negative impact on a person's life and they're living a life of uh, sin. So it's inside out. What is inside is coming out and they're having a negative impact on the person's life and they themselves are living in um, sin. Okay. And then he says being self-condemned. So a warped person, a divisive man uh, is um, basically, Paul is saying, they're aware of their true spiritual state, you know. Uh, the, the Greek term self-condemnation may also be understood to mean uh, that the twisted teachers are condemned by their own uh, behavior, okay. So they know uh, that, you know, they're aware of their true spiritual status, so their spiritual uh, position, okay, and uh, <clears throat> You know, they, uh, they also know that, uh, you know, they're condemned uh, by themselves in what they are believing, what they're teaching, and what they are propagating, okay? And then Paul goes on to, uh, you know, uh, tell, he's nearing the end of his letter, so he's telling uh, the Cretans and telling Titus uh, to provide for God's people, which he mentions in verses 12 to 14. Before we read verses 12 to 14, any of you have any questions regarding verses 9 to 11? So how does verses 9 to 11 practically apply to us in our uh, present day situation? Would anyone like to throw some light on that? How does uh, verses 9 to 11 of chapter 3, you know, uh, relate to us in our context today? Anyone would like to share? No one wants to share? Yeah, there are people we meet, they pretend to know Christ by asking too many questions, okay? Uh, we also have, uh, but they deny the deity of Christ, yes. Uh, they just want to uh, discuss for the sake of discussing, just empty words, but uh, they are not really interested in knowing the truth, in believing the truth or being led to the truth, right? Uh, so with such people, you know, uh, don't waste your time uh, unless the Holy Spirit prompts you to do it because he's the one who can convict them and lead them into salvation. Um, anyone else? We have people knocking at our doors in Bangalore City. They are from uh, either the Church of Christ, Jehovah Witnesses, uh, different cults, and they come in and, you know, they just want to uh, you know, uh, discuss, propagate their own teachings. So they are blinded to the truth and they don't want to know the truth and listen to the truth. So it's basically a waste of time if we are going to really spend time discussing with them because it's going to end, uh, lead to nowhere and end nowhere because um, they are already blinded by the truth and they don't want to know the truth, you know. Uh, if they're looking for the truth, they're searching for the truth, their desires to know the truth, then, you know, we can uh, speak to such people. Uh, we have a lot of people who come from New Age philosophies, cult movements, uh, who basically endlessly talk and talk and talk, but uh, people who don't want to know the truth and believe the truth, uh, 
and to be led by the truth. So such people are warped uh, in their understanding, they're divisive, and like Paul says, you know, uh, just totally avoid them, okay? Uh, we'll move on to verses 12 to 14. Can somebody please read verses 12 uh, to 14, please? When I send Artemis to you, O Tychus, be diligent to come to me in Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. Send Zenas, the lawyer, and Apollos on their journey with haste, that they may lack nothing. And let our people also learn to maintain good works, to meet urgent needs, that they may not be unfaithful. Amen. Thank you, Lobega. So here Paul is continuing his discussion about uh, how to maintain good works. And uh, even as he's drawing the end of his letter to uh, Titus, uh, he's um, talking about um, his fellow laborers. And we know that usually, uh, you know, it's very characteristic of Paul's letters uh, in his the, end, the ending of his letters, he mentions uh, names of various uh, co-laborers. So we know that Paul did not labor alone. He worked with uh, others. He worked together uh, with a team of people uh, who were, you know, who labored along with him for the cause of Christ, were committed uh, to the cause of Christ into the kingdom of God. And uh, so uh, these verses shows that Paul was somebody who was a very friendly person, who was... Um, uh, you know, into team building um, and uh, engaging with people and also somebody who uh, was appreciative of what others were doing to build God's uh, kingdom, which is something that we all must learn uh, and also very thankful to people who labor along with him is something also that we need to um, learn. So here he mentions a few significant members of his team. He mentions uh, Artemis. He says, when I send Artemis to you, now this is uh, the only reference of uh, this person, Artemis, that is mentioned here in uh, Titus chapter 3. And from his name, we can guess that he's a Gentile. Um, and um, from the fact that Paul considered him as a worthy replacement uh, for Titus at Crete, we can uh, we can come to a conclusion that he was somebody who was uh, well established in the ministry. He was a faithful, mature man of God. He was competent. Uh, he was also somebody who knew the scriptures very well. And, um, you know, uh, uh, Titus uh, met Paul at Nicopolis and then he headed north to Dalmatia. Uh, we read about this in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 10 and 12. And uh, most probably Artemis would have replaced him in um, Crete. So we see that Artemis was a good able, capable leader who Paul thought of, uh, somebody would take uh, uh, the position uh, or the role of Titus at Crete. And then he mentions Tychicus. Tychicus, another faithful uh, Gentile minister and fellow worker with uh, Paul. Uh, he was a native of Asia, which is uh, uh, modern day Western Turkey. Uh, he had traveled with Paul uh, you know, um, and uh, uh, with him on his uh, third missionary journey. We read about this in Acts chapter 20, verse 4. And later he was with Paul during his first Roman imprisonment. Uh, we also see that Paul sent the letters to uh, the church at Ephesus and the church at Colossae, that is Ephesians and Colossians with Tychicus, uh, who told those churches about Paul's circumstances. Uh, we read about this in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 21 and 22, and Colossians chapter 4, verses 7 and 9. And later we see Paul sent him to Ephesus uh, to relieve Timothy of his responsibilities so that perhaps Timothy could join Paul in Rome before his execution. We read about this in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12. And Paul also refers to Tychicus as our beloved brother and faithful servant and fellow born servant in the Lord, uh, Colossians chapter 4, verse 7. So we see that uh, Tychicus was a valuable member in Paul's team. Then Paul mentions Zenus the lawyer, and um, 
this this is the only reference of Zenus here in the Bible. So his uh, uh, Greek name means he was also a Gentile lawyer, uh, but you know he was not very well off. Maybe he was poor, and that's why uh, uh, Paul asked Titus to supply his needs. Um, uh, it may mean that he, uh, you know, uh, Zenus was a, a Jewish ex expert in the uh, law of Moses or the Mosaic law. But, uh, you know, anyway, he was uh, uh, a well read man. He was um, also a, a, a lawyer, so he was well established. But uh, set aside his character, his uh, career, sorry, set aside his career. Uh, you know, to uh, accompany Apollos on the strip. And so Apollos and Zenus probably would have carried the epistle of Titus to Crete and met Titus um, at Crete. And then we have Apollos. Uh, he was a Jew who was from Alexandria, which is in the northern part of Egypt. Uh, he was a good orator, very, very uh, a, a man who speaks very well, eloquent orator. Uh, he also knew the scriptures very well, and that's why he was maybe a good orator. And uh, uh, Acts chapter 18, verses 24 and 25, mentions um, Apollos as somebody who is very fervent in uh, spirit. Um, we see that uh, when he came to Ephesus, uh, where uh, uh, Priscilla and Aquila were there, they took him aside and they taught him. Uh, about uh, uh, the way of God, the Holy Spirit, and all things concerning the gospel more accurately. And um, even though he was somebody who was learned, he was a Jew, he knew the Old Testament law, you know, because he was good in the scriptures like Paul, but just willing to listen to this couple, Aquila and Priscilla, shows that, uh, you know, he was somebody who was very humble, uh, who had a teachable heart. And also we see that later on uh, he had a powerful ministry um, uh, amongst the churches at uh, Corinth. Um, and then Paul uh, writes here and says, you know, uh, after he mentions Artemis, Tychicus, um, uh, Zenes, and Apollos, you know, he says, and let our people also learn to maintain good work. So let our people is uh, basically is referring to the believers or the church or the Christians at Crete. Um, and then he's saying, you know, uh, uh, let these uh, believers at Crete take the, le uh, the lead to do some good works. Uh, uh, what he is talking, what he had mentioned in verse 8, the same chapter. And uh, Paul, you know, um, um, uh, tells Titus, that the Christians at Crete must learn to do some good deeds. So he uh, uh, talks about Zenus and Apollos who need um, financial help in their journey and their, uh, in their ministry. So he says, here's a good opportunity to put into practice what I have been telling you. Uh, uh, so let the Cretans engage in good works, let them just bless uh, Apollos and Zenus. And uh, he reminds them of this privilege to uh, bless them with their good deeds. And then verse 15 is uh, the farewell where Paul says, all who are with me greet you, uh, greet those who love us in the faith. So basically all with me is uh, Paul may have been in Macedonia or Achaia. Um, and we know that Paul was never alone. So besides uh, Zenus and Apollos who were there to take that this letter, uh, 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 Paul was also maybe uh, connected to a church where he was staying and fellowshipping. Uh, so here uh, Paul is talking about all of them uh, with him, send their greetings, and those who love us in the faith. So Paul is talking about the fellow saints in uh, Crete. And then Paul closes his letter by saying, Grace be with you all. Amen. So Paul closes all of his letters with uh, the mention of God's grace. Um, which is not just something that, you know, a polite formality that Paul uses. Um, uh, but here, the Greek text uh, literally reads, the grace be with you all. So the grace is basically the abundant, uh, sustaining, all-sufficient, the full grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
and Paul uh, was uh, so mindful of this grace because he knows it was this grace that saved him, that reached out uh, down to him, even as he was this angry persecutor, persecuting the churches, the believers, the Christians who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and he says this grace reached out to him he was, as he was traveling on the road to Damascus and changed his heart. So it was he was completely someone undeserving of the love, the grace, the favor, the mercy of God. Uh, he deserved God's judgment and punishment, but he received his mercy. Uh, we also know that God's grace motivated Paul uh, to suffer hardships and go through persecutions for the sake of the gospel. It motivated him to serve Christ with um, unstoppable zeal. Um, and uh, we also know that God's grace, um, as shown on the cross, was Paul's only message that he was preaching out uh, to the people. And God's grace was sufficient to sustain Paul in all his trials and keep him from exalting himself, but keeping or exalting the Lord Jesus Christ in everything that he uh, did. Okay, So even as he closes with grace be with you all, uh, which expresses not only his affections, but his desire for all believers, uh, since the grace is so important uh, for our experience and uh, with God, our Savior. And even as we walk or journey in this life, uh, we need his uh, grace. So grace is not only the source of our salvation, but it's also the basis of our sanctification. It's also the basis of our fruitfulness and also the basis of our um, a reward. So he ends this letter by saying, Grace be with you all. Amen. Okay. So this is the end of uh, Paul's letter to Titus. Anyone has any questions, any doubts? Before we move on to the last book that we have to study, that is Philemon. Any questions, doubts? Okay, uh, there are no questions, no doubts. We'll move on to uh, the book of Philemon. Uh, so what uh, do you all know about uh, the book of Philemon? Any of you have read the book of Philemon before? Yes, no. Do you have some answers? I have read that book for the last 25 years. Okay. Thank you, Lubega. Anyone else has read the book of Philemon? Nobody's interested in it was not, uh, nobody was interested in reading the book of Philemon. Okay, uh even if you've not read the book of Philemon, um can you share some things that come to your mind when you think about uh, this letter that Paul writes, which is the book of Philemon? Anything you all know? Yes, Lubega? Yeah, the book of Philemon, we all know that uh, he was a slave. A runaway slave who had run away. The guy, no, the man, the book is written to Philemon, but uh, it was about a guy they call Onesimus, who was a runaway slave. Philemon was a very rich guy uh, who was staying in the town of Colossi, and he had a church, uh, had the, like a cell group, according to these days, we would call it a cell group. He was having a cell group in his house. And he had run away, and when he ran away, it's possible that he had taken some belongings. The man they call Onesimus had taken some belongings to from Philemon, but according to the interpretation, even taking his time because he was a slave, even being away from work, that is that alone is a loss to 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 Philemon. So 
it is just a short book talking about it pictures it's like it pictures christ's master before us about god that is it would be the implication or the application of the gospel to of that book to me or to us in the current generation let me keep this mouth of mine shut for now thank you lubega that was quite a detailed uh, uh briefing on the book of uh, philemon good thank you anyone else likes to share your thoughts on the book of philemon okay uh if not we will uh look at the introduction to uh to philemon uh, who do you think wrote this uh book the man himself paul or paul we... yes thank you lubega so paul wrote this letter uh to uh, philemon it's a more personal letter uh so we don't call it an epistle but it's more a personal letter to uh, philemon um and uh, paul who's the author who writes this letter uh, refers himself three times as paul here in verses 1 verse 9 and verse 19 now uh the book uh, the letter of philemon has only one chapter so uh you know, a very uh, small and a very short book uh, so the author is paul let's look at the place of origin and date uh, this book was uh, or this letter sorry is written from uh, rome in ad 60 uh, and 61 uh and paul wrote uh, the epistles of uh, colossians and ephesians and this letter to philemon uh, during his first roman imprisonment so paul is writing this from rome during his first roman imprisonment along uh, uh, to, uh, as he writes his this le the letters or the epistles to the church at colossae and ephesus uh, which is colossians and ephesians now um, how do we know that Paul wrote this letter during his first Roman imprisonment. Uh, in this letter to Philemon, Paul clearly mentions in verses one, verse nine, verse ten, and verse twenty-three. He mentions himself as a prisoner, so it's um, uh, you know very clear that he was in uh, uh, imprisonment. And Paul's imprisonment also seems to be from the same location um, that he writes. Uh, um uh, uh that uh, 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 location as that is we as we read in in colossians uh, because the names mentioned in philemon uh, chapter 10 oh, and uh, sorry uh, verses 10 and 22 and 24 um or uh, the names that are mentioned in verses 10 and verses 22 to 24 are the same names that Paul mentions also in Colossians chapter 4 verses 7 uh, to 17 so it becomes clear that um, you know uh, he wrote this at the same time he wrote the epistle uh, of Colossians to the church at Colossae and um, the names of Epaphras Mark Aristarchus, Archippus, Demas, Luke, uh, Onesimus, Paul, and Timothy, uh, which is mentioned in Colossians chapter four, verses seven uh, to seventeen, is also mentioned in Philemon chapter one, uh, verses ten and twenty-two and twenty-four. Okay, we also know that it, uh, this letter was written during his first Roman imprisonment because in Colossians chapter four, verses seven. uh to 9 uh, tychicus was entrusted uh, to deliver the letter to uh, philemon and the colossians of the church at colossae so he was accompanied with onesimus and this is the same onesimus that is mentioned also in philemon and uh, paul was under uh, house arrest at rome uh which would have allowed him to you know uh have visitors and also his co-workers and hence there was this possibility that he could meet onesimus and uh, lead him to the faith and also uh, mentor him and uh, dr luke who wrote the book of acts uh, was with paul in rome and details of this are given in the book of Um, act so all this uh, very clearly points out to us 
that uh, Paul wrote this letter along with the Colossians, the epistles of Colossians and Ephesians uh, during his first Roman uh, imprisonment. Now, some scholars debate and say uh, or present their understanding that, you know, um, uh, Paul wrote this letter from Caesarea, uh, but it's unlikely for the these following reasons, just two reasons. Uh, it's unlikely that uh, Onesimus, who was the runaway slave um, uh, from Colossae, uh, would have fled to Caesarea because uh, if he escaped to Caesarea, it would, he would have been easily noticed and caught. And, uh, and it's unlikely that he would have uh, had access to Paul like he would have had access to Paul Oh, when he was at Rome, because at Rome he was under house arrest and it was, you know, feasible for him to meet visitors and other people to come and visit him. So it's not possible that Paul wrote this letter from Caesarea. Also, Paul expects to be released in the near future since he requests Philemon. Uh, in this letter we read uh, in verse 22, to prepare a place of lodging in his house because he is going to come and visit him. So this probably would not have been the case uh, if Paul was writing at Caesarea, where Paul knew that his only appeal uh, would have been to appeal to, or his only hope would have been to appeal to uh, Caesar. Uh, so it's uh, unlikely that he uh, wrote this letter from Caesarea. Now, some understand or some scholars debate and say that Paul wrote this letter from Ephesus, but it's not possible because there's no evidence that exists to affirm that Paul was imprisoned in Ephesus. Uh, and it's unlikely that Onesimus would have fled to Ephesus because it was uh, 100 miles away from Colossae, which is a long journey. Uh, it's not possible, and hence Rome was the only place that he could have gone to because it's closer to uh, Col Colossae, and also it is so highly densely populated that uh, you know his presence would not be very evident uh, there of a runaway slave. Okay, now. Um, uh, who is Onesimus? Uh, Onesimus, like Rubega mentioned, is uh, uh, the slave of Philemon. Um, you know, um, uh, how does he come into contact with um, uh, 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 Paul at Rome? Is uh, you know, uh, even as he was a slave who ran away from uh, Philemon. Uh, we know that he had also stolen money, like Rubega said. We read this in verse 18. He had stolen money from his master and ran away. And uh, he most probably ran away to Rome uh, because I said it was densely or heavily populated and it was a safe place for him to hide. Uh, but uh, how does he come into contact with uh, uh, Paul? Uh, two suggested uh, possibilities is how this came about. Um, now, Epaphras had come from Colossae, um, and he would have come around this time uh, to visit Paul. Uh, we read about his visit uh, in Colossians chapter 1, verses 7 and 8, and verses uh, 12 and 13 of chapter 4. And, uh, you know, when Epaphras had come to meet Paul um, uh, at Rome, uh, he would have seen and recognized Onesimus uh, because Epaphras was one of the leaders at the churches at Colossae. So he would know Philemon, he would have attended his church uh, that Philemon hosts in his house, and he would have uh, known Onesimus and, you know, he would have brought him to Paul. Or uh, another possible reason that scholars mentioned how Onesimus uh, met Paul was Onesimus may have exhausted all his money and he would, would have been in a desperate need and maybe he would have been familiar with the name of Paul and um, so, um, you know, and a situation bearing large and looming large over him, he would have turned to Paul uh, as a last resort. He would have known Paul because Paul would have, you know, visited Colossae, um, 
stayed at Philemon's house and uh, would have uh, been acquainted with uh, uh, Paul even as he served him, known that he was a good man. Uh, maybe somebody would help him out, not uh, uh, send him back to Onesimus or, uh, you know, give him back, uh, hand him over to the authorities so he uh, goes over to meet uh, Paul. So these are the two possible reasons how Onesimus would have, uh, you know, uh, met uh, Paul. Um, now, when Onesimus met Paul, Paul, uh, we know, took a deep interest in this runaway slave. He, read, he led Onesimus to accept Christ. And then Onesimus becomes very useful uh, for Paul. Uh, he ministered and, uh, to Paul while Paul was in house arrest at Rome. And uh, uh, Onesimus becomes very dear to Paul, that Paul calls him as a son in the faith in verse 10 in this letter. Um, and uh, Paul also would have grown very fond of him, you know, liked him very much. Uh, so in verse 13 in the same letter, Paul is telling Philemon that he wants to keep uh, uh, Onesimus with him because Onesimus is very useful uh, to him. But because Onesimus belongs to Philemon, Paul knew that it was his responsibility uh, and it was right on his part to send him back to his master uh, and send him back to Colossae. So he sends him back to Colossae with Tychicus, who carried uh, the epistle of Colossians along with his letter to Philemon. And um, uh, Paul, you know, could have exerted his authority, uh, his apostleship, his... Uh, acquaintance and taking the advantage and um, not sent back Onesimus, kept him with him because he was very useful for Paul. Uh, but, you know, uh, Paul followed uh, the law, the Roman law. Okay, the Roman law, uh, you know, required that if a runaway slave was found, the person had to send the runaway slave back to his master. So Paul, we see, even as he's writing to um, uh, Titus, he says, you know, submit to uh, authorities, obey the authorities in chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Here we see him keeping, uh, uh, you know, obeying the uh, authorities, even though he had upper hand, even though he was uh, in a better position um, uh, of just keeping back Onesimus, and also doing what is right in the Christian fellowship, sending back the slave to his um, master. So something beautiful that we can learn from Paul here is even though we might be people who are uh, in uh, great leadership responsibilities, uh, uh, elders in the church, uh, you know, have, uh, uh, or maybe you are the head of your home, you know, uh, you can use your authority in the right way, uh, but also important to be mindful that even as you exercise and use your authority, that you're mindful of uh, obeying the law of the land, obeying what is uh, what the law of God says in His uh, book, uh, in the Scripture. You know, keeping to that, obeying it, and not uh, coming to a place of um, arrogance and pride and saying, you know, I'm an elder, I'm. Uh, I'm in place of responsibility. I can do what I want to do. And sometimes I can even step over the uh, uh, the, the law of the land, I can step over even what is uh, the law of Christian fellowship uh, requires me to do. I can do what I want to because I'm in authority. But we see here and we can learn from Paul that, you know, uh, he did what was rightful, even though he loved Onesimus, he wanted to keep him, he was of great use, great help, but he does what is right in sending him uh, back, okay? So in this letter, Paul requests Philemon uh, to receive Onesimus, um, not back as a slave, as a beloved brother in the Lord. He talks about this in verses 10 and 16, and perhaps the hope that Philemon will return to Onesimus uh, to him for ministry in verse 20. One. Now, I don't know if you ever thought uh, of this question. Why would uh, this personal letter of Philemon to a person, you know, Philemon, it's not even talking about 
uh, church administration. It's not talking about, uh, uh, you know, uh, how to run a church. It's not talking about church growth. It's not talking about church principles or even how to overcome false teachers. Just a very personal letter uh, to uh, uh, Philemon about his runaway slave and just accept him and receive him back. Uh, why would this personal letter to Philemon be in our Bibles? Any thoughts? Any thoughts? Yes, Lubega? It just it pictures what Christ did for us to the Father in heaven. For, for instance, we also had wronged God by trespassing his laws deep there, back there in the Garden of Eden through Adam. And uh, the Christ paid the price, just as Paul says, in case of oh, this man did anything wrong to you, put that on my name. So it is, I, I basically, I think that's the major reason to why it appears. It pictures what the Christ did for us and is still doing for the generations to come. Thank you. Thank you, Lubega. Yes, maybe. Anyone else has any thoughts you'd like to share? Okay, so uh, history uh, tells us, or scholars tell us, that in AD 110, uh, the bishop of Ephesus was a person called Onesimus. And they say it could have been the same runaway slave, Onesimus. So if Onesimus was in his late teens or early 20s when Paul wrote this letter to Philemon, uh, he would have been about 70 years old when it was AD 110. And, that, uh, and this was not an unreasonable age for a bishop in those days. So um, they say that, you know, most likely uh, Onesimus would have uh, wanted this um, letter to be part of the Bible because uh, there are some historical evidences that the letters of Paul were first gathered as a group in the city of Ephesus. And uh, it would have been at that a time when Onesimus was the bishop of Ephesus, and perhaps Onesimus, uh, who, com who first compiled all of Paul's letters, uh, ensured or made sure that um, his letter uh, or his contract of freedom uh, was included in the Bible as well. So um, maybe that's the reason why uh, this letter to Philemon is uh, there in the uh, Bible, apart from, you know, what Lubega mentioned uh, would have been the guidance of the Holy Spirit, okay? Any questions uh, or doubts or clarity you require about introduction to Philemon? Okay, if um, there's no questions or clarity that's required, we'll I move on to uh, to study uh, Philemon. There's only one chapter, uh, so we'll study chapter one. Uh, can somebody please read verses one, two, and three, please? Anyone? Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, the to Philemon, our beloved friend and fellow laborer. To the beloved Apphia, Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in our, our in your house, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Subhashis. So Paul, um, you know, uh, the, uh, beginning this letter to Philemon is very unusual because of all the of the thirteen letters Paul wrote to the churches or individuals, in nine of them. Uh, he calls himself as an apostle in the opening verses. But in this letter, along with the, uh, five, uh, the, uh, the epistle to the church at Philippi, that's Philippians, and the third church at uh, Thessalonica, which is First and Second Thessalonians, Paul appealed to his readers more as a friend and less as an apostle. So all of the 13 letters that Paul wrote, 
you know, uh, to the churches or to individuals. And nine of them he calls himself as an apostle. But um, but Philippians, First and Second Thessalonians, and in this letter he appeals, um, uh, you know, to them uh, more out of sympathy and out of love, uh, more as a friend and less as an apostle. So in the very beginning itself, when Paul is writing this letter, he's telling, uh, trying to tell Philemon, Philemon, I'm not coming here and writing this letter to you in terms of my authority, and I'm not exerting my authority that you have to take back on this and mistreat him, not as a slave, but as a beloved brother. But I'm writing to you as a dear friend, and on that, I'm appeal, making an appeal of sympathy and of love alone, and not on basis of authority. Okay, uh, we'll come back after the break and we'll continue. <laughs> 